in addition to being the screenwriter, Daniel, you're the, the nephew of the the folks we just watched on screen. Uh, so only some of them. Only uh, some yeah, of them. Um, <laughs> Martin Ginsburg uh, was my mom's older brother. Right. And as I understand it, that sort of idea for the script happened at Martin Ginsburg's uh, funeral service. Is that right? Can you oh, tell yeah, us really where it came Oh, you're going to bring everyone from? down. Oh, that. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, uh, a friend of Uncle Martin's got up and gave the, uh, uh, just a beautiful eulogy in which he briefly mentioned the only case that Ruth and Marty ever argued together. Um, and, and he did so in the context of, um, because to the end of it, I mean, literally the very end of his life, Uncle Martin said that the most important thing he had ever done was hand Ruth that tax court advance sheet because it allowed her to do the things that she had done. And um, that was the first time I heard the story and I was pretty newly married at the time. My wife and I very consciously had said out loud, we wanna be like Ruth and Marty. That's what we want our marriage to look like. And so when I heard that story, I thought, wow, that would make a great movie. Um, that was my first thought. My second thought was, what kind of asshole am I? I'm sitting here at my uncle's funeral, <laughs> mining his life for material. You can't do a that. A screenwriter. That's, uh, <laughs> Deeply understood in this room, I'm sure. Um, uh, Felicity, one of the things that's so unique about Ruth Bader Ginsburg is her speaking voice. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you found that voice. Uh, yeah, it's um, it was interesting. I mean, early on, uh, I was obviously incredibly nervous playing such a huge icon and, and someone who's so beloved. Um, and being a fan myself, it's quite an interesting um, process. How do you play someone that you, you absolutely adore? Um, but obviously you have to find the idiosyncrasies and the edges of that person. But I mean, in terms of voice, I had a decision quite early on in the sense of, do I play, obviously, Ruth as, as she is now at, at 85 is, oh, come on, come Ladies in. Ladies and gentlemen, Mimi Leader. Mimi Leader in the house. <laughs> Woo. Woo. <laughs> okay. Hi. Is Justin here? Not no. with me. No. He'll be the next installment. Hi, gang. Hi, I Mimi. Was just talking about. I was like, you had an interesting choice to make. I really wanted to hear about that. Oh yes, um, uh, yeah. So basically, it was: Do I play the voice that everyone knows so well, um, which is Ruth at eighty-five years old, which was very different from the recordings that we heard and the early, um, the early recordings of her in court and her um, her voice um, then became such a, a way into the character. And I thought, no, I have to, I have to stick to the truth of how that voice was that I heard in those recordings. And it was interesting in showing me how um, Ruth wasn't just fighting in terms of her gender, in terms of her faith, but but also in some respects uh, because of where she was from. And there was um, there was a bit of snobbery around that. So in the court, you know, in that time, in the 1950s, you were kind of expected to have quite a standard accent. Um, and so it's fascinating to analyze her. Literally, I spent a lot of time thinking about Ruth Bader Ginsburg's vowel sounds, um, which, uh, which you would hear these little moments when she gets upset or she gets frustrated in court and these, this, this, there would be the stronger Brooklyn sounds w would would come through, um, but it was yeah it was just so useful because obviously we know her so well from 1993 um, and she's been in the public eye so it's very much about um, finding the clues to how she was when she was younger before she became the icon she is today. And I, I have to tell you as someone who's known Ruth and Martin Ginsburg for my whole life, these two are just uncanny in the roles. That's really the work that you guys did and the talent you put into it. Thank you. Thank you. Army, I wonder if you uh, <laughs> had occasion to think about why in an era when so many men had really traditional ideas about gender roles, Martin Ginsburg apparently was much more open. Why do you think that was? Um, I think it speaks to his strength. You know, I, th I think it's, it's very easy to dismiss a man who did all that as, well, you know, and we, we just got done doing press in Europe, and it was really funny because some of the older journalists, they'd say things like, well, you know, he was kind of a weak man, and you know, blah, blah, and I was like, oh, okay, you're really outing yourself here, fella. Um, but, but I think, it's, I think, I think the opposite uh, is true. You know, I mean, this was a man who was willing and able to defy the gender norms of the time. You know, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, men rarely stayed home and, and cooked and cleaned and, and helped around the house, which just really wasn't the done thing. But he was so secure, not only in himself, but in the equal partnership that he had with Ruth. You know, I mean, they, they had a very progressive relationship for now, and, and even much more so in the 60s and 70s. Um, I think it was, 
the fact that he understood the symbiotic relationship of a long or the symbiotic nature of a long lasting relationship. Uh, he, he also knew that what Ruth was doing was important. I mean, the fact that he said up until he died that the most important thing he did was ever hand her that tax book, it, it shows that, that he recognized the importance of, of his wife's mission and what he, she was doing, and, and that he really saw a dignity and a nobility and, and found joy in doing whatever it took to help facilitate and be sort of a buttress for her. Michael, can you talk about writing a theme for a character like Ruth Bader Ginsburg? How did you how did you think of her musically? Well, I think uh, when Mimi and I first sat down and and she showed me the movie, you know that the beginning is so inspiring. This Harvard marching band and this idea of, you know, the, there was something about that band, the the excitement, the the forward momentum, and the rhythm and the and the sound of evolution and the sound of time going forward. So. And Mimi kind of threw me into the deep end right away. Often I like to start at the beginning of the film and kind of go through it kind of cue by cue, but um, Mimi wanted me to very early on kind of attack really the, the turning point in the film where Ruth looks at her daughter and realizes we don't need to change heart, hearts and minds. The change has already happened. It's right here in front of me. And then the, the brief writing, um, Montage. So we we wanted to kind of attack that right away, and I think it w it ended up to be a great thing because when I watched the movie, I was so inspired and kind of excited, and a lot of that feeling went into that anthem that that you know I wrote for that, and and so that's the sound the sound of of this forward momentum, but also we enjoyed turning kind of the cliches on their head. Often you, you know the sound of drums and brass and so on is something and that's the apologies uh, any more coming or uh, we've probably got like seven join more. us join <laughs> us justin um yeah so the the sound of of um you know that's kind of a male sound and it's kind of a sound of the establishment so we really enjoyed kind of turning that on its head and making that ruth sound the sound of snare drums and brass and and energy and confidence and and the the true kind of essence of American progression. First, we have the 50s in Boston, and we have the 70s in a number of different cities. How did you create it? Where did you create it? Well, we shot in Montreal, and one day in DC, and we shot it in 34 days. And, um, you know, I wanted the film to have a contemporary feel, even though it definitely is in its period. And um, I wanted it to have deep colors and a very strong palette and feel contemporary, but in a classic way. And um, I feel we did that with our angles, with our shots, you know, with our color palette. Um, and I think in the way that people be in the behavior of our characters, we didn't say we were in the 50s or the 60s. We were people because everybody did things the same as they do today. You know, relationships, um, their relationship was a very um, forward-thinking one. And um, so we, the behavior was, was contemporary. And I mean, that's what my approach was and ours as a collective team. Justin, the ACLU office looks like it was probably kind of a rollicking place in the 70s. Is, is, is Mel Wolf still alive? Yes, Mel Wolf is still alive. And w can you tell us, did you have any opportunity to... No, I didn't. Uh -huh. It was actually, I mean, it's, the pressure was sort of off me because we had tried furiously to locate him, locate pictures of him. Mm -hmm. We found one picture where there were, we weren't sure which, we knew he was in the photo, but we weren't sure which one he was in the photo because mm -hmm. he, he was very elusive. Um, and he was sort of a bit of a controversial figure in the ACLU towards the end. Um, so we knew a lot about him. Obviously, I was relying on uh, Daniel's source material uh, for, you know, and and you know, his research on him. Um, and then once we, had, it was very frustrating because once we commenced shooting, he sort of popped up uh, via sort of a, sort of a s 10 degrees of separation type of thing. Like, oh, Mel Wolf heard that you're playing Mel Wolf and the, he's a much older gentleman now. Um, and it, we'd already sort of established the look and sort of we'd already shot many days. So it was like- You didn't have a mustache. I didn't, have, yeah, we, we didn't. So we were sort of, you know, we obviously knew, um, you know, from newspaper clippings and things, you know, uh, his general sort of forward-leaning stance at the ACLU um, and some of the things that he was starting to do, which 
wasn't, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, that wasn't very typical of the ACLU at the time. They started to become sort of more proactive um, as far as sort of defending freedom of speech and things like that around that time or slightly before, and he was sort of instrumental in doing that. So, um, you know, I had to sort of just sort of pick a lane and, and try and stay in it um, with Mimi's direction and, and Daniel's material and sort of you know, sort of invented a little bit. Some of the the sort of same barriers that uh, young Ruth Bader Ginsburg confronted entering the legal profession or trying to, um, women have confronted trying to enter the directing profession. And I wonder if you felt any kinship with her as a character in that respect. Very much so. I felt a lot of commonalities with Ruth. Um, you know, I've had the door shut in my face many times. And... Um, you know, we're both um, Jewish women. We're both in long-term marriages. We're both Jewish. We've both broken the glass ceiling in our own with our own professions. And she truly inspired me um, in every possible way. In, in, and that is why I wanted to make this movie, because she definitely made this planet a better place, a freer place for all of us. Um, and so... I was truly, I had to make the movie. And a lot has changed, a lot. And there's so much more to go. And that's why I think we all made the film. Well, I thank you all very much for being here. I thank you all for being here.